Hello EU4 players, my name's Riemann, and in this video I'm going to go over the exploits in patch 1.32. I've taken these from the community from various forums, and here I'll show you what they are, how they work, and how to do them yourself. As always, an important disclaimer is that Paradox is pretty quick at patching these, and I make no guarantees that they work on later versions of the game. Furthermore, in most of the footage you'll see, I'm not doing Iron Man so I could quickly get into a position to show these off. However, these are all confirmed to be working with Iron Man, so if you want to use them to get achievements, you absolutely can. With that out of the way, let's get into 12 exploits in patch 1.32. The first exploit is very simple and very powerful, essentially letting you ignore coalitions altogether. One of the main ways of dealing with coalitions is through truce juggling, i.e. making sure you have a truce with anyone who'd want to join a coalition against you, as nations with truces are ineligible to join coalitions until the truce expires. The main way to get truces is through war, but going to war obviously has lots of costs associated with it, which balances the system. But for whatever reason, Paradox decided to make it so that ending guarantees now gives a two-sided truce instead of the one-sided truce that it used to, meaning you can trivially guarantee a nation and then unguarantee them to get the truce, and they'll be blocked from joining coalitions for five years. If they are already in a coalition against you, they'll be forced out of it. You can do this on an unlimited number of nations. There are only two real bottlenecks. The first is diplomat travel time, although that's not really that much of a big deal. And the second is that you need to be moderately more powerful than the nation in question to actually make the guarantee in the first place. If you abuse this trick to its maximum potential, then you can basically remove coalitions as a threat altogether, making expansion far easier than it otherwise would be. This next exploit is powerful and so simple that I'm surprised it's taken this long to become known. It allows you to take multiple peace deals from an enemy, weakening them far beyond what should be possible in a single war. What you need to do is be in a war with some allies, and completely defeat the enemy, occupying all of their provinces. It's important that only you, and at most, a single ally control the occupations. Then mothball all their forts. You can make sure you got them all by hovering over the fort maintenance line on the budget tab. Then put a single regiment on as many of their provinces as possible, with forts being the highest priority. Then wait to the first of a new month, and transfer all the occupations to that ally that can make the separate peace. In my case, since Kandar controls some occupations already, I have to give it to them first. What you're looking for is for your ally to have 100 individual war score. The two factors that make this exploit work are that the AI is practically guaranteed to make peace very quickly when at 100 war score, and that when they make the peace, your troops are not exiled letting you trivially reoccupy almost everything in a single month. Because you mothballed the forts, they should all fall in a single siege stick except for the level 1 capital fort, which you will have to re-siege. Then you repeat the process by giving everything to the next ally, and go on down the list for every ally that can make a separate piece. In this instance, Kandar and Karaman both took huge chunks of land in Anatolia, Poland actually gave me my cores back so I didn't have to spend the war score on them, Austria and Albania both released nations, everybody took money so they went bankrupt, and at the end of it all, I still got to do my own peace deal, where they were weak enough that they could be vassalized outright for future reconquest. The main limitation of this trick is that you're beholden to what the AI wants to take, but if you can get the right nations into a war, this can catastrophically damage an enemy to the point where they can't recover. The next four exploits deal with primitives. The first is that the goods produced in tribal lands reset to unknown every time the game is reloaded. They then re-roll with the standard chance they had before, so if you want, you can keep reloading until you get a better setup. While any nation with tribal land can do this, it becomes supercharged if you're in the process of settling in an area where gold can spawn because you can cherry pick the gold provinces to lock them in, reload, settle only the gold provinces again, and repeat ad nauseum. If you're patient enough, you can take a trade goods setup that would normally look something like this into a setup that looks more like this, simply by saving and reloading a bunch. The next exploit allows you to explore with cogs or war canoes. This requires admin tech 5 to unlock the first idea slot and exploration for explorers or conquistadors. While you can assign an explorer to some canoes, it normally wouldn't do much since only lightships are supposed to be able to explore. However, if you control click to automatically transport an army by sea, the cogs will explore into Terra Incognita if their path requires it. 
You can do this as an Australian native to reveal normal nations to the north, which you can then declare war on and conquer to get access to feudalism, saving points and letting you pick whichever reform path you might want. This gives you some flexibility and lets you jump into the action far sooner than waiting for Europeans to come colonize. Or you can just use this next exploit, which lets primitives build any ship type they want. Normally, primitives are only allowed to build transport ships, with light and heavy ships being unavailable in both the macro builder and the province construction tab. But Paradox forgot to disable them from naval templates, so you can just use those to make the ships instead, assuming you've unlocked them with Diplotech 2. Do note that your sailor income is garbage as a primitive, so you won't be able to make a massive fleet, but you should be able to make enough to do some things like exploring with three light ships or making a few heavies to clear naval crossings. The next exploit allows you to merge mission trees. To make this work, you want to have the requirements for multiple non-generic mission trees to be fulfilled at the same time, while also triggering the effect to get the new missions to actually reset things. The vast majority of mission trees are effectively mutually exclusive with each other, but there are a few that aren't. The most notable two currently discovered are the British and Mongolian mission trees. The former requires the country tag to be either England or Great Britain, while the latter requires the country's primary culture to be Mongol, Kalka, or Oirat. The easiest way to do this is to either start as, or reform into, England, then switch your primary culture to one of the three I listed. In this case, I'll do Kalka then form Great Britain, which is doable as England no matter what your culture is. This resets your missions and gives you both trees simultaneously, although it's clear that you're not meant to do this given how messed up the trees are when they're jammed together like this. This is also possible with at least some other mission trees. For instance, reforming the Mamluks with Mongol culture will merge the Egyptian and Mongolian mission trees, and forming any tag that has missions while being a pirate will merge pirate and that tag's missions, although in both cases, the mission trees are far smaller than the British and Mongolian example. I didn't do an exhaustive search through the missions, so it's entirely possible that there are some more interesting and compatible combos, especially as new ones get released in future DLCs. The next exploit allows you to make use of mercenary generals without using their troops, at least most of them. The devs have done a lot of things to make it so you can't alter merc bands at all, with restrictions to splitting and transporting them that can make them rather clunky. However, it turns out that you can just drown the regiments you don't need, reducing their maintenance and force limit upkeep accordingly. What you do is take the mercenary band and the minimum amount of transports out into the ocean and wait for the boats to sink to attrition. When the boats are almost dead, have one more transport ship come in and merge with the stack, so that you can be sure you have just one ship remaining at the end. Then, bring the ship home, and you can attach the single regiment with the general onto one of your main stacks to use him in battle. This one regiment will have all the reserve manpower from the entire band, so it's basically usable for the rest of the game. Getting a free general for one force limit and minimal maintenance cost is certainly worth it, especially when the generals reroll for free when they die, and they have a much higher pip distribution than what you typically get early on. This is also a great way to functionally get some extra leader slots throughout a campaign. The next exploit was discovered by myself as I was testing the new revolution mechanic. I didn't find much that would make the revolution useful, but I did find a way to kill it really quickly. The two ways you're supposed to get rid of it are either to wait several decades or go through the revolution disaster. Both of these options can take a long time, during which you'll face the economic effects of higher autonomy from the revolution center, which will hurt your economy. However, you can end the revolution much faster by doing the following. First, it should be noted that this works the easiest if the center spawns in your territory. Assuming it does, put down a client state in the province where the center is. Wait for the client state to flip to being revolutionary after a month or two. Then wait a bit longer until the Crush the Revolution cast a spell shows up. When it does, give the client state another province and declare war using Zed cast a spell, and then win the war. You can also release the client state and wait for the truce if you don't want to take the stab hit, but that forces you to wait for five years. For the peace deal, dismantle the revolution and take the province where the center spawned. It's very important that you do both of these two things, and only these two things. If you only dismantle or only take the province, the center sticks around. Likewise, if you try to take both provinces in the full annexation, you can't use the option to dismantle, and so again, this won't work. Doing this correctly means the revolution will be ended permanently with minimal effort and expense. The provinces it did get to will be cleaned up in 20 years with the normal event, requiring no further effort on your part. The next exploit buffs republics to make them actually viable. 
Republics have been in a bad spot for many patches now, with their monarch point generation being less impressive than it used to be now that monarchies can disinherit, and since absolutism became a feature with republics being less able to utilize it. Even with the buffs they received in the Emperor patch, republics still have to choose between high absolutism and faster elections, where in most cases, monarchies are just better. But this trick can fix that. What you want to do is be a republic, then switch your primary culture to one in the Russian culture group. This unlocks the Veche reform, which you should flip to, then switch your primary culture away from Russian back to anything else. This breaks the Veche reform and means you're now a default republic. The benefit of being a default republic is that you now have a base of four-year election cycles with no absolutism penalty at all, making it far superior to the other tier 1 reforms. The main downside of this trick is that you can't pick reforms in the later tiers while this is active, so you'd want to either do this later in the game when all the reforms are unlocked, or I guess you could simply live without the later reforms. With this trick, you can have a republic with fast re-elections that still has max absolutism. You even have enough absolutism above 100 that you can pick the reform that reduces election cycles by one year to get three-year election cycles for insane monarch point generation while still maintaining full absolutism. The next exploit allows you to get the Buddhist deity as any Hindu nation. Typically, it'd be best to just stick with Shiva to get 10% core cost reduction, but if you're doing a one faith or one culture run, then it can be helpful to get the missionaries and culture conversion cost reduction of the Buddhist monuments like Borobudur, Bagan temples, and Buddha statues. The normal way to get access to the Buddhist deity is through missions available to Majapahit, Sunda, or Khmer, but you can get this deity as any Hindu with a simple trick. There's a privilege available to the Brahmins called Choice of Personal Deities that you should pick, that unlocks a decision to switch your deity. For whatever reason, the check on whether you've unlocked Buddha isn't present in this event, letting any Hindu nation take it. You can only use this decision if you haven't picked a deity in the last 20 years, so if you want to keep it permanently, then you'll need to have your rulers live longer than two decades, otherwise there will be some gaps. But otherwise, there's nothing else to it. The next exploit allows you to declare war on enemies without dragging their allies in through calls to arms. I believe this only works in Iron Man because it requires the game to save when exiting. What you do is go to the menu and click to exit the game, which brings up the confirmation dialog box. Then you can right click the nation you want to declare war on and go to the war declaration screen. The goal here is to click to start the war and then very shortly afterwards hit the C key to confirm exiting the game. If you hit C too early, the war declaration won't go through and you'll have to try again. But if you do it too late, the allies will get called in and you'll be out of luck. You'll know you got it right if you see the war icon appear, but do not see notification of allies joining. The timing is quite precise, so you might want to back up your save just in case you want to try again. But it's not extremely tight or anything, as I can usually get it in a couple of attempts. Then you can reload the game and the enemy's allies will not join the war. You can do this in pretty much any situation where a call to arms would happen, like for tributaries, alliances, guarantees, etc., letting you circumvent diplomacy to fight wars as 1v1s if you so choose. The final exploit is a couple of zone of control tricks that, depending on how you use them, can be extremely powerful, effectively letting you bypass forts altogether. If you've watched my video on zone of control, you know that the return province is decided per army, not per regiment. The crux of this exploit is that when you attach one army to another, they effectively function as a merged army. And while there are some checks to prevent illegal moves, the checks happen before the move is made. So if you queue a move and then attach, you can do a bunch of stuff that you're not supposed to. One example where this can be used is if you've got multiple armies sieging a fort that came from multiple directions. If you queue a move and then attach your armies, they can move as a unit despite having different return provinces. The even more broken strat is to use this in conjunction with an exiled army. The easiest way to black flag an army is by getting access to a neutral third party and stationing an army there before you declare war. Then have it meet up with a normal army, queue some orders, attach, and you can run through the enemy forts like they don't even exist. This can be great for blitzkriegs where you run up and stack wipe the enemy when they shatter, followed by sieging all their forts simultaneously. That's all the exploits I have for you today, be sure to try them out quick before Paradox can patch them. Also, I put links in the description where you can find out more information on all of these. Be sure to check them out. My name's Riemann, and until next time, thanks for watching.